very much uh, for, for coming today. Um, welcome to uh, the House of, of Commons. My name is Bel Riviradi. I'm a Member of Parliament for Streatham and the Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group for African Reparations. And um, today we are having a meeting, hopefully, with, with Lee Day. Um, and, and, and as you know, it's the legal basis for reparations for the transatlantic slave trade. You're going to be able to hear from a, a range of speakers who are better legal experts um, than I on this matter. Um, and they're going to, to, to put to you uh, the case of for, for, for reparations, one which unfortunately has been denied for too long. And just to explain to you, uh, for those of you who don't know about uh, the, the ABG, uh, we work at the moment with, with two secretariats, the Stop, Stop the Manganese campaign and Accord. And we work, work across three strands, the first being restitution, looking at the return of artifacts, uh, the return of human remains, and the return, um, and, and I think, of, of, of records. Uh, we look at community reparations, the way in which uh, the slave trade um, has affected people uh, right into this country, to Europe, into the US, um, the fact that there has been no apology and the fact that we continue to suffer the effects of institutional racism. And, and we look at development. When I talk about development, I mean stopping the situation that we've got into where we have come, uh, uh, it has become a means to, means to, it's become an end in itself. Now, when international development began, it was all meant to be about you know helping countries that were in need. Now it's become an industry. Um, and once something is an industry, the fact remains, um, and, and it's a sector, that it benefits people. Some people are, are benefiting from keeping people in the global South Pole. And all of these organizations that were set up, unless they are working for complete sustainable development, unless they're working actually to bring their organizations to an end, they are just other forms of neo-colonialism and they are part of the problem in themselves. So we're working across those three strands. It's very, very important that we look at this legal case for rep reparations. And one of some of you may have seen a few weeks ago. Um, that I asked the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, at uh, Prime Minister's questions, if he would make an apology for the slave trade, something that um, the late great Bernie Grant, who was the founder of the African Reparations Movement in the UK, asked for um, many years ago now. And uh, the Prime Minister uh, started with a flat out no. Um, and whilst I wasn't surprised that he didn't make an apology, he actually rolled back from the usual um, platitudes that are given. We know that in many, many cases, we've seen heads of state and other prime ministers, um, you know, talk about deep sorrow or regret, yeah. uh, sentiments that I don't think are befitting of, of one of the worst crimes um, in human history. But at least they said that. He said no. And people keep saying, well, um, you know, why should we have to apologise? Why should we have to go further? And why isn't, express, as, why isn't expressing sorrow as good as making an apology? And, and I will say, because it seems to me that as the call for reparations um, becomes louder and louder, it seems more and more that people are less willing to use the recognized language of culpability. So in, in, in effect, some people, and it seems this country are acting like a corporation who will express deep regret, who will not say the word sorry, who will not apologize for the simple fact that they know that they've done something wrong. And if they admit to it, that they may be liable uh, for, for said damage and be made to pay it. So when people refuse to apologize uh, for the horrors of slavery, that's all that I see in that, that they are simply trying to avoid having to make amends. And we cannot say that, um, you know, the idea of reparations or, or paying for things or making some sort of payment or, or restitution is something that hasn't been done. We've seen it done um, to many different people in, in, in the past. And actually, very, very clearly, the money that we're talking about, the, the wealth that has been amassed is present all around us. I mean, I mean it's literally present all around us in, in, in this place. Um, but it's present in the fact that we know that these these the many of these families that were actually had to give up their slaves when when the slave trade was ended and we have to remember that the slave trade was ended not because of the benevolence of um some some people it was ended because the slave revolts made it unprofitable for them so when the slave trade was ended the largest loan in british history was taken out and it was used to compensate the slave owners 
not those that were enslaved. And the government thought in 2015, when they finished paying this loan off, that we would all be excited to hear that Great Britain had contributed, people today through their taxes have contributed to ending slavery, not thinking about what it was that they had done. So not only are, 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 you know, are the funds available in, 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 in today's, in, in, in present day, uh, the people that we're talking about, those that were directly impacted, their ancestors are present in today, and, 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 as the, and those that benefited are present. So all, all people that would be involved in your normal legal claim are, 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 are present. Um, and, and all things that will be involved, involved in your normal legal claim are present. So the question now stands as to why we can't get to a place where people want to pay uh, reparations. And so I'm really going to be handing over uh, to, to people who are going to lay it out um, very, very clearly for you in terms, in terms of, of, of the case and why they should be made to make and how they can um, um, go, go about paying. And Lee Day is, is certainly one of the best places to do it. They are the lawyers for CARICOM. And as we know, CARICOM are, are a group of Caribbean nations that have been asking for, um, asking for reparations for, for a number of years now and are trying to take their claim um, even further. So I'm going to begin um, with, with Jackie uh, McKenzie. We need us know with Jackie. Thank you, uh, Belle. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm not right in front of one of these the microphones. I'm just really here to do a bit of a welcome, really. Um, so on behalf of the day, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this important discussion on whether there is a legal case for reparations. And it's our pleasure to be having this meeting jointly with the all-party parliamentary group for reparations, which my good friend, the uh, MP for Stratton, Bel Rivera Abbey chairs. Um, I just want to correct one thing. Um, Lee Day has been working with CARICOM or speaking to CARICOM <laughs> since 2013. The CARICOM has not instructed us, so just in case the CARICOM people listening in think that I've um, given a case to Lee Day without uh, their authority, then I haven't. <laughs> um, I want to start by acknowledging and giving due regard to the reparationists, some of whom are in this room, and some of you who have been campaigning for decades for reparatory justice, for the lives lost, <clears throat> the brutality of the system of the transatlantic slave trade, the loss of opportunity for Africans in the Caribbean, the Americas, Africa, and the diaspora, the destruction of identities, cultures, and economies, all of which reverberate on people of African descent and of African heritage to this very day. And I know at the moment we're seeing quite a lot of movement around reparations, quite a lot of discourse and discussion. Um, and I'm not necessarily seeing some of those older voices around the table. So we want to make sure um, that the historical aspects of the struggle for reparations aren't ignored when the lawyers and the families and the governments and so start talking about what is reparations. There will be lots of views on what reparations is and means, who the legitimate voices are, whether or not there's a legal, moral, or a political case, or a combined approach to be had, who should get it, whether it should be money, projects, the development of infrastructure, debt forgiveness, restoration of artifacts, etc. In time, we hope to clarify some of these important questions, particularly being led by the victims of the manganese, and that is what reparations requires, is to repair the lives of the victims. So we really want to see uh, those people at the forefront of the discussion and the struggle. And that must be the starting point. You know, the manganese, the transatlantic slave trade was the most brutal and effective campaign against humanity, a crime against humanity, which built the wealth of some nations at the expense of others, and which resulted in a race of people losing their very being of self and identity, which heralded in racism as we know it, and white supremacy. And as I said previously, the impact of those pernicious things particularly racism reverberates on black people, particularly people of African heritage. 
The transatlantic slave trade effectively reduced the lives of Africa to that of a resource. People became a currency and they were expendable. To make that happen, there was a requirement to not just practice the most brutal uh, system, but also to work people to extract from them the most supernormal of profits. And the extent or, 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 or the consequences that Africa and Africans, and I mean Africans as a people of African heritage, lost their prior civilization, which consisted of strong and powerful political connections, economies, trading arrangements, education and scholarship, arts and cultures, and family structures. Very often people think that the history of Africa and the history of Africans started with the slave trade. It's so evil was that system that I just learned recently that, and we know, and I, I had some of my education in the Caribbean, and those of you who did may have studied history and a book called The Making of the West Indies. And, you know, and it's the nearest we got, even in the Caribbean, to be taught our own history or part of our history. And uh, hadn't ever come across the fact that sharks used to follow the ships, the slave ships. And that was because so many bodies were just topped over overboard by those doing the enslaving if people became weak or ill. I also discovered though that some people chose to throw themselves overboard as part of the resistance, part of the struggle to uh, escape the slave trade because that's a part of the history that's completely missing, that there was a resistance and that there was a struggle. And I implore upon you to read Richard Hart's the book, The Slaves Who Abolished Slavery, to get more information on that. In much of the literature and even the artwork on slavery, we see the plantations, we see the great houses, but very rarely do we see the African people unless they're on a treadmill being whipped. African people were not visualized. The record has been sanitized and it's been sanitized by the oppressors. So much so that despite the works of people like Oladapo and Fiano, it's very difficult to understand what was the life of an African <coughs> who was enslaved. What we do know is that people worked very, very long hours. We've heard in, or, or we've discovered in records sometimes 18 hours a day for no uh, recompense. We know that supernormal profits were extracted from the transatlantic slave trade. And we know that that making of supernormal profits continued well after abolition and well into the colonial and neo-colonial era. And some of you will be aware of the fact that when we started, was it 2015, that we were just continuing or just finished paying off compensation um, to people who lost out uh, because of abolition. So the oppressors have done much to hide the lives and experiences and the true extent of the slave trade. What was the prior wealth of Africa? What were the systems? Thankfully, there are economists, particularly in the Caribbean and Africa, working on these subjects to try and establish what exactly are we talking about? What exactly are the losses? And CARICOM has, its 10-point plan of its demands and has worked. There's always this dichotomy about whether Africans sold out um, or, but, but, but fortunately, we now see a coming together of African nations and CARICOM nations with African Americans and Latino Africans wanting to address reparations together. We have families of people who did the enslaving coming forward. We've got the Bank of England, the Church of England. Last night, I was at an event at the US Embassy um, that was being, all, or which was organized by Balliol College of Oxford, which was looking at how they can provide redress um, for their involvement in the slave trade. And what they decided to do was to create a module to be taught in schools in the UK. 
Um, and very interestingly, because it's not a compulsory subject, and some subjects sort are of compulsory, and one of the speakers there told us that the Holocaust is compulsory, but the slave trade isn't, and they both should be compulsory. It means that she's got to fit it in and around her curriculum, because obviously their children are, or pupils are forced now to study to a curriculum so they can pass their exams. So it's, it's almost like an extra curricular activity, and that's something we need to campaign to be changed. But one of the interesting things that the master Helen Ghosh said um, was that um, they looked into their archives, and their archives are extensive. They've got an exhibition. If you're in Oxford, go and have a look at their exhibition. And she discovered that they've got about 100 million of reserves, and of that, only 300,000 pounds they think can be connected to unjust enrichment through the transatlantic slave trade. Now, how on earth did they work that out? <laughs> because if that was just a hundred pounds at the time of abolition, what about the interest and compound interest and what you were able to do with that money in terms of investment and development in your own people, etc.? It's not just saying, well, we got this sum for this particular plantation that we were investing in, and this is what it's worth today. Another exercise needs to be conducted to ascertain what are these figures. And we don't know. Now, there are lots and lots of problems with bringing a legal case. Um, they will be fraught with issues around limitations. Um, they'll be fraught with questions about who are the defendants, for, for instance. Um, are they governments and institutions, or are they individual families? Um, I said some of the families are coming forward, and we have some members of the Chibelian family here tonight who have decided to do some good work and have, uh, have in their archives, or using the UCL archives rather, discovered that the Chibelian family had enriched themselves through the Atlantic slave trade, and have decided to look at where they made that money, they discovered these plantations in Grenada, and to put some money into the reparations movement there for uh, work to be done, research to be conducted. Now that, with that came an apology. The apology is absolutely welcomed. Um, the program of wanting to support is welcomed as a start of a conversation, but there are some pitfalls with that kind of approach, because it does, it must be done in partnership with those who are the victims. And I think having spoken to members of that family just recently, including up to last night, I think they recognize that, and that's one of the things that they want to do, so it's welcome. They must also work in partnership with those activists that I spoke about at the start, who have been working for a very, very long time. When I'm here, the Bank of England, I went to the Bank of England exhibition with some of my colleagues, <laughs> where they have a list of first names. I know uh, Africans were dehumanized and not given their proper names or their full names, so I suppose that is the only information they're ever going to have. But they have identified the names of people who were enslaved on two plantations in Grenada, and a part of Grenada called St. David's, which doesn't have a very mobile population. It's my view that the descendants are still the people who live in that area now. And there's quite a lot of work to be done to ascertain that because there are cemeteries of people who were enslaved and you can exhume um, some of the bodies and look at are those people there now direct descendants. But these are projects that are enormous and require resources. And I think one of the first things that needs to be done as part of the reconnaissance work is looking at some of these very wealthy organizations and institutions, they're not about the families, not necessarily blame families. This is about institutions and governments and organizations ought to put money now into doing some of this research so that we can identify who some of the claimants might be. Now, I've gone way over my time, so I'm just going to finish on one final thing. I am a lawyer, but nobody ever wants to go to court on anything. What we want is to bring people to the table. And I'm not saying that because I think these cases are difficult, because I think some of the cases may we may to hear later, but I think some of them have some potential. And there are some situations, like with the Drax estate, with the, the descendants who have formed themselves into a group because of the Morant Bay uprising, you know, their ancestors have just gone down 
and the British government has now admitted that that was an unlawful killing, so they may have redress. The Grenadian descendants of people determine who they are might have redress against the Bank of England, they've admitted liability, they've got a whole exhibition, uh, they're still on, go and have a look at it. Um, so there's lots of interesting things that we could look at as lawyers that we could start to have a go at, but really and truly institutions, organisations ought to be talking to the victims. If there are organisations that have credibility that represent them, then fair enough. Working partnership with the activists and work with the lawyers to make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So that what we have is a partnership approach to resolving this very, very thorny subject that is going to go on for decades, possibly hundreds of years, <laughs> in a way that is amicable, moral, and actually happens, because we'll be in court for decades and possibly, you know, get nowhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chef. You're absolutely right. It starts um, with a conversation and perhaps understanding that reparations cannot be about money alone. Um, because if we start from a place of, of money, um, you know, we, we would never be able to completely compensate uh, people. So it has to be about looking at those institutions and looking at everything that's followed, followed on for this. But in order to do that, we do need to work in that partnership we've talked about and, and actually begin with these institutions opening up their records. We don't know because they have all the information and, and, and we do not. And so we're going to go over, and I know Jackie went over her time because she, she's allowed to. Um, nobody else is allowed to. <laughs> we're going to go over next to, to uh, Walker Siachalinga, who is a lead day, is that right? Yes. Uh, is a lead day training lawyer. Um, and he's, uh, he's working in lead days international and group litigation department where he assists on human rights and environmental damages campaigns, and he's assisted on investigations um, into historic claims relating to the treatment of local populations at the hands of British colonial forces, as well as investigations into claims on behalf of families and individuals who are seeking reparatory justice for the continuing impacts of the enslavement of, the enslavement of their ancestors, which we see um, in, in so many different countries um, every day. Walker, over to you. Thank you so much, Belle. And it's, uh, it's, it's very intimidating to sit next to Jackie, but to be on this panel. So, um, and as, as you know, that has laid out really the, the framework and the developments that we are dealing with that have happened recently, but also really the horrors of, um, of, of the transatlantic slavery. And, and it's, it's very humbling. Um, and in some cases, I'll go so far as to say it's traumatic, really, to to think back to what happened to our ancestors. <clears throat> but even more traumatic is this idea of being told to move on. Um, the moment um, this is raised, the moment that is spoken about. Um, so even though we are dealing with um, law, which can be quite dry sometimes because it sort of rests on technicalities and roots, what is underneath all of this is people's lives, it's people who are dreams, it's mothers and fathers and um, brothers and sisters um, and children. You know, and, and as Jackie highlighted, it was those people um, being fed to drugs uh, to enrich somebody else. So yes, we are having a legal discussion, but it is a discussion about people's lives, but not only the people who left us, but also the continuing impact um, of, of those of us who are lucky enough to be here. Um, it's, it's something as well that um, on this panel is uh, Lord Jeffrey, who has done a lot of work over a number of decades uh, in raising awareness of uh, the reparations scholars. Um, if you haven't yet, I'd recommend that you look up um, his speech to the House of Lords around 1995 or 96, where he really made a strong passionate <clears throat> about, uh, or pretty much made a case for reparations. Um, what well, was something again looking at that speech is really some of the response that came from other okay. members of the House of Lords and, and some of those sentiments that they expressed in, in trying to argue, for instance, that the, the legal aid budget, rather than the, the aid budget, the UK's aid budget is uh, effectively reparations and that. And I think what was insulting reading back um, the record, I think there was one of the members who argued that because Lord Jeffrey had tabled um, this discussion, he would be late for his train 
and it would claim reparations for his train ticket home. I mean, such is the the um, I guess such is the opposition uh, that we face, uh, that black people face, um, and uh, people face when we raise the very idea of, of reparations. It's being spoken down to. It's being told to move on. Is the topic being made lighter? It's being told that we should be grateful that the reason aid budgets and uh, and so on. But to the issue tonight, which is, is there a legal basis for reparations? My focus would be on, again, going back to uh, Lord Jeffrey, he put down seven propositions or bases on which a claim could be made. And one of those uh, bases was uh, a potential claim based in unjust enrichment. And the way that was phrased, phrased is to effectively bring a legal claim against either the government or the states of, of the, the families and the companies that promoted um, and were enriched by the transatlantic slave trade. So this would be a claim based in uh, 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 an area of law called um, unjust enrichment. So one of the reasons I am drawn to um, this particular area is because of the recent developments, which uh, Jack very eloquently highlighted. We have a number of organizations and institutions coming forward, uh, volunteering information to say we were enriched uh, as a result of our involvement in, in transatlantic slavery. We know, for instance, that the Church of England has uh, employed, I think, Grant Thornton. They did a very meticulous exercise in going back in time and being able to calculate how much they say they were enriched by. And they arrived at the figure of 100 million, um, which um, they said they would use to, to advance the causes of uh, communities which are still affected by that. Uh, and there are other organizations as well which have come up with various figures. Um, but what this shows is that today, in today's society, there is in circulation money which can be linked directly, money and wealth, and privilege, which can be linked directly to the enslavement of Africans, directly to the work that Africans did, for which uh, they were not paid at a time when they were powerless to do anything um, about it. So what is unjust enrichment? And how would it um, help in a, in a claim such as this? So under this... Uh, uh, area of law, a claimant has the right to have restored to them something that was lost or stolen against a defendant or a person, a company in this case, or uh, uh, the estate of the family who were unjustly enriched uh, at the claimant's expense. So you have three things you have uh, one party being enriched, you have another party uh, at whose expense the enrichment takes place, and then thirdly, you have what are called unjust factors. So conditions which made it possible for those people to, to lose uh, their wealth. In this case, in the case of uh, we're dealing with, we're talking about the powerlessness that our, our ancestors, uh, the power that our ancestors lacked. They, they were powerless to do anything about the conditions in which they were. So that would satisfy the three elements um, of um, uh, unjust enrichment. Now, by way of example, I'm just going to use um, an illustration of a serving uh, member of parliament by the name of, of Richard Drax MP. Um, we know that he, um, and historians might be better uh, as to the facts, but we know that he's still uh, in 2017, he inherited Brasso, uh, which is a property in Barbados. Um, and we know that that was a, a property which his family uh, purchased back in the 1600s, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, purchased. Um, we know that that was converted through the use of the labor of enslaved Africans into a very profitable uh, uh, plantation for those people. So at emancipation, uh, the, the family was awarded the equivalent of three million pounds in today's money um, uh, as a result of the loss of, of, of enslaved Africans who were freed at uh, emancipation. But what is really interesting about um, this particular example is that last year, Mr. Drax MP updated the parliamentary rate of interest and declared that the property in Barbados um, is worth at least 100,000 pounds and continues to generate rental income of at least 10,000 pounds. So we see a family that has been over successive generations enriched originally by the labor of enslaved Africans, but more recently by a property which was made profitable through the labor of enslaved Africans uh, and continues to generate rental income for this family which is declared um, in, in this House of Parliament. So that is a very clear case of enrichment. Now, contrast that with the fact uh, or the, the plight of the people who live in the vicinity of this property. So media reports suggest, for instance, that secondary schools are 
dilapidated, that primary schools are in need of repair, and that those people who work on this plantation, which is still a functional plantation to this day, um, that they are paid below average wages for what is known in Barbados. So there's a clear case of a family that all the successive generations have been enriched through the uh, labor of enslaved Africans. And then on the other hand, what we would argue to be the descendants of enslaved Africans who continue to live under very difficult circumstances in the shadow of Bruxelles, in the shadow of this plantation. Uh, and, and this property which was um, established by uh, the drug company. So those are the two examples and the contrasting fortune that we see. Now, how would um, reparation work uh, in a setting such as this? Well, firstly, you'd have to identify the claimants. So the claimants would have to be uh, uh, people who are linked to the Africans who were originally uh, enslaved by the drugs. So it would be, and, and, and we'll put our hands up this, it would be a narrow pool of people. So it wouldn't be, for instance, everyone of African descent or everyone in Barbados would have to at least establish a link between uh, the claimants, uh, people who are bringing the claim today, and the people whose labor was initially uh, used to, to enrich the drugs. And I'll explain in a moment why that is important. <clears throat> um, that is important uh, because in America, this uh, basis of claim code and justice enrichment has been tried. And those who have looked into this will know, for instance, that there were a series of cases around between 2000 and 2005 where a range of claims were brought on the basis of unjust enrichment. Now, one of the things that made those claims difficult is that the claimants were unable to show a link between the living uh, uh, descendants of the enslaved and the originally enslaved. So it was normally a group of people who are of African descent, but they were unable to sort of conclusively draw that link between the people, uh, with to the people, the, the enslaved Africans who are originally enslaved. So that was one of the of what the, the courts in the US cases are uh, considered as a fundamental defect. The second thing was that they were not able to uh, particularize or argue with enough precision this idea of unjust enrichment. So they argued that unjust enrichment had taken place, uh, but were they able to satisfy the particulars? And I think part of the reason was also because they were going up against a large number of defendants. So you had, for instance, rail companies there or successive rail companies. Okay, I'm trying to type. Okay, so it's essentially, uh, I hope you do get the, the, the idea of how the principle called unjust enrichment would help us to show the contrasting fortunes, not only of those who were enriched and continue to uh, uh, be enriched today, but also the fate uh, and the enduring legacy of, of the transatlantic labor. Of course, we do know that legal claims by their nature um, uh, do not tell the whole story, but what they do help is to shine a spotlight on the horrors of such evils uh, as this. What they do do is to bring the public into a courtroom, uh, to bring uh, historians, archaeologists, and other experts able to explain the horrors. And we think that by raising that public awareness of really how awful uh, this was, but also the enduring and continuing legacy uh, of the transatlantic slave trade and the impact um, on descendants, we hope that if the public is more aware of that, uh, there will be a more sort of a willingness towards reparation and towards accepting this rather than it being still uh, sort of a, a taboo topic. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Walker. That was an excellent way of, of, of taking us, us through it. And in, in terms of the abuse that the all party parliamentary group for um, African reparations to, uh, to receive a response for call for reparations, um, often linked to people saying uh, that awful thing that haven't we paid enough in international development that you that you that you started with. But no, I think it's very, very interesting um, to, to lay out how, how a claim uh, could work. And um, you're pointing out Barbados. Uh, very interesting. We recently had a, a early day motion bounced back from our table office because they said we we made too many mentions of drugs. Uh, we're, we're working around that that now, but but it's because our next speaker that we're going over to is um is in Barbados. Um, David uh, Commission, Commission, who is a lawyer and ambassador. Um, he is Barbados's ambassador to Caricom. And he's the country's leader on reparations and is instrumental in the negotiations with, with the Drax family uh, regarding the estates in, in, in Barbados. He's also the author of its uh, The Healing of a Nation, the case of for reparations in an era of recession and re recolonization. And I'm, I'm hoping 
that David's going to also help me uh, uh, learn how well to deal with, with, with drugs in, in this particular context, as we are having difficulties here, even being able to mention it in, in, in Parliament. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Bell, if I may call you so. And um, thanks to Lee Day and the all party parliamentary group on reparations for inviting me to be a part of this um, very important panel. Uh, the topic is, is there a legal basis of a claim for reparations for the transatlantic um, slave trade? And just to answer your question very quickly, Bell, before I get into the topic, um, the Barbados government has established a committee that is going to be attending to that matter of the Drax family and the Drax Hall plantation in, in Barbados. So that process should start soon from now. Now, <clears throat> way back in the year 2000, um, I'm, I'm addressing this question of whether there is a legal basis for a claim for reparations. And I want to take you back to the year 2000 when I was typically leading Barbadian delegations to the United Nations headquarters in Geneva as we engaged in the preparatory meetings for the World Conference Against Racism. And we were going to these preparatory meetings, uh, pushing res resolutions, um, declaring slavery and the transatlantic slave trade crimes against humanity, um, insisting that um, reparations were due. And at, at one point, um, the European Union obviously got a little upset with the Barbados delegation. And the European Union delegation asked us for a bilateral meeting. So we had this bilateral meeting. And the purpose, the European Union delegation's purpose was to lecture us um, that um, they were not liable to pay reparations because slavery was legal when it was um, carried out um, back in the uh, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, um, 19th century. And, um, and that, that was their mantra that slavery was legal. And at one point in this bilateral meeting, I, I said to them, look, we don't think slavery was legal. Why, why don't we have a public debate on this? It, you know, it, it, it will be me against whatever team you pick from the um, European Union um, delegation. Uh, we can find a room at um, UN headquarters here, and we'll, we'll invite all of the delegates to come, and we'll have a public debate on whether slavery was legal. Well, needless to say, that was the end of the meeting. They immediately shut down the meeting and left the room. <laughs> um, their position was that slavery and the transatlantic slave trade were only declared to be criminal or unlawful acts after their abolition, after um, Britain and other European nations stopped practicing these outrageous acts. Now, I'm going to address that issue of whether slavery was legal. I'm going to prove to you that slavery was indeed um, utterly illegal when it was practiced, but I want to share with you the text of a 2016 letter, January 2016, that CARICOM wrote to a number of, to, to the heads of government of a number of European states. Remember, CARICOM launched its reparations campaign in 2013, by 2016, our CARICOM Reparations Commission had developed its 10-point reparations plan or demand. And um, 
by January of 2016, CARICOM was writing to the six European heads of government. We had determined that six countries um, should be targeted. Um, the UK, Portugal, Spain, France, um, the Netherlands, and Denmark. Those were the first six. Since then, we have added four others. So the number is now at 10. But mm -hmm. I'll share some, pretty, not the whole letter, but some extracts from the letter to give you an idea of the CARICOM's approach to this issue of reparation. And I quote, I write, Prime Minister, as chairman of the CARICOM Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparation, to formally bring you up to date on matters relevant to the work of the CARICOM Commission on Reparations for Native Genocide and Slavery. Those centuries have passed since those historical crimes of slavery and genocide were committed, wounds continue to lie deep and legacies continue to endure. Some three years ago, the heads of government of CARICOM took the decision to establish the Commission on Reparations in light of the considerable conversations in the region and beyond about the enduring legacies of chattel enslavement and native genocide on our societies. We believe that in the context of the recently declared UN International Decade for People of African um, Descent, that this offers a viable conceptual framework within which the relevant issues can be understood and discussed. There is a case to answer for reparatory justice by those states that forcefully relocated Africans to the Caribbean for centuries, practiced chattel enslavement of Africans, and are responsible for the genocide of native communities. The considerable historical and legal data gathered constitute the evidentiary basis of the case. Public opinion in the, reg in the region now calls for action in this regard. It is the widespread view that these matters should be discussed with your government. In this regard, I am mandated by CARICOM to take this initial step to invite your government to meet with CARICOM in order to discuss how best we may amicably exchange our views on this matter. My colleagues and I are mindful of the intense emotional issues that are likely to arise, but are of the view that diplomatic engagement is the preferred approach on matters of truth, justice, and conciliation. For us, this is a matter that should cause neither contention nor discord. It is a matter of utmost importance to our respective nations as we prepare to fashion lasting and sustainable relations for the future. Our reparations plan has been prepared by the commission. It speaks to issues ranging from educational support uh, for surviving indigenous peoples to healthcare research on a range of relevant illnesses within the black population. Critical to this approach to reparatory justice is the call for a meaningful apology. My colleague, heads of government and CARICOM and I would welcome a meeting with you in the mm -hmm. first half of 2016 at a mutually convenient time and place. Prime Minister, we look forward to a dialogue between our nations as we seek to go forward in a new relationship of reconciliation and collaboration. But we in the Caribbean are also conscious 
that new relationships often require healing old wounds. Let us work together, heal such wounds for the sake of the future relationship between our peoples and nations. So that's, those are the relevant passages of the, of the letter sent by CARICOM to, these, to six um, European heads of government in 2016. <clears throat> Now, two things emerge from the text of that letter. Firstly, that there is considerable historical and legal data to establish that there is a legal case to answer for reparatory justice, and I quote from the letter, by those states that forcefully relocated Africans to the Caribbean for centuries, practiced chattel enslavement of Africans, and are responsible for the genocide of native, native communities." End of quote. The second thing that emerges from the text is that CARICOM's preferred approach to this matter is through a process of discussion and negotiation of the claim. That's the preferred approach. However, the clear subtext of the letter is that litigation, a court case, is an option that CARICOM holds in reserve if the preferred approach does not, um, does not work, or if the preferred approach, if the European parties do not engage with the preferred approach. So having laid that background, let's get to the crux of the matter. Were the transatlantic slave trade and the associated system of racialized chattel slavery, were these phenomena legal during the 400 year long period that they were orchestrated and practiced by European countries and their national governments, let's say between the, the end of the 15th century and the 19th century. We in CARICOM say no, they were not legal. They were not legal under the systems of national law of the various European states that participated in the transaction transatlantic slave trade and in the system of racialized chattel slavery in places like Barbados and Jamaica and Grenada, etc. Nor were they legal under the system of international law that was in existence in the world between the 15th and 19th centuries. Let us look at the national law situation as it pertains to the United Kingdom. Let's examine the United Kingdom. Well, what we find is that slavery had at some point been brought to the territory of England by the Romans and by continental Europeans. We learn that Anglo-Saxons raided England for slaves and eventually took over the country mm. in the fifth century. We learn that many Celts and indigenous Britons were enslaved and that that situation of slavery persisted until the end of the 11th century when the Normans conquered England. Thereafter, slavery was abolished in England. According to the Domesday Book, an extensive survey of England and parts of Wales completed in the 1080s, it was discovered that around 10% of people in the area of London were slaves. In 1080, William the Conqueror banned sale of slaves to non-Christians, and in 1102, the Ecclesiastical Council of London, the so-called Westminster Council, banned the slave trade within England, decreeing, quote, 
let no one dare hereafter to engage in the infamous business of selling men like animals and the quote within a generation slavery had all but vanished in england mm -hmm. indeed it was replaced by serfdom now england commenced its involvement in the transatlantic slave trade in 1562 the date of the date of captain john hawkins first slave raiding voyage to the west coast of africa let us think back to 1562 what was the state of english law in 1562 well in 1562 the crimes and torts of kidnapping rape assault and battery trespass to the person false imprisonment etc were all well established in english law <laughs> um the so let us look very briefly at at hawkins commencement of the transatlantic slave trade um the the trade commenced with hawkins's voyages in 1562 and 1564 and this is how those voyages were described in several publications including the 1878 publication of the Hacklut Society entitled The Hawkins Voyages. And I quote from the Hacklut Society, quote, Hawkins sailed with three ships from England in 1562. In the river Sierra Leone, he captured at least 300 blacks, partly as he said, by the sword and partly by other means. In 1564, Hawkins set out on a second voyage. The new expedition again made for the river Sierra Leone and every day went on shore to take the inhabitants, burning and spoiling their towns. End, end of quote. Um, the reality is the British slave trade was born in intense violence and 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 criminality and i need now to and and so <clears throat> britain went on to establish um, a slavery regime in which african human beings were branded were kidnapped were whipped had their noses slit um, were mutilated were castrated um, were raped, and how then do you make the case that any of this was quote unquote legal? Well, the clue is to be found in the Barbados House of Assembly. Um, Barbados started the the English in Barbados started practicing slavery, the enslavement of African people in as early as 1627, when they first settled the, 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 the island. But by 1661, they had established a colonial house of assembly and the colonial house of assembly um, passed an act of that house of assembly in 1661, which purported to legalize the system of slavery, African slavery, that they were already practicing. And this is the this is the slate of hand that they attempted. The Barbados House of Assembly, in the very text of their legislative act, sought to justify and legitimize the condition of slavery by saying this. This is what I quote from the act. This is what they said. Listen carefully. The plantations and estates of this island cannot be fully managed and rendered useful without the labor and service of a great number of Negroes and other slaves. Uh, well, In as much. Up, to wrap up if it's okay. Yes, I'll wrap up now, but I need Thank to make this, this point. In as much as the said Negroes and other slaves brought here 
to the people of this island for that purpose are of barbarous, wild, and savage natures. They are wholly unqualified to be governed by the laws, customs, and practices of our nations. It therefore becomes absolutely necessary that certain other constitutions, laws, and orders should be framed and enacted in this island for their proper ordering and regulation. Thus, the misbehaviors, rapes, and inhumanities to which they are naturally prone and inclined may be restrained." End of quote. So you see, having, having, having been forced to acknowledge that in England, it was a crime to, ens to, to, to enslave a human being. It was a crime to kidnap a human being. It was a crime to rape and to mutilate and to castrate a human being. What the Barbados House of Assembly purported to do was to deem African human beings not human beings at all. It was to say these beings from Africa are not human beings like, like English men and women are. These are wild, barbarous, savage, animal-like um, creatures. And therefore, the law that applies in England will not be applied to them. We will, we will determine another type of law which authorizes us to kidnap them, um, to mutilate them, uh, to brand them with hot irons, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, it is a general principle of law that legislative acts that are factually absurd are null and void. Whatever the Barbados House of Assembly did, they could not transform human beings into animals or chattels or things. The Africans remained human beings. And if under English law, it was a crime to kidnap a human being, then it remained a crime um, when that kidnap and those impositions were imposed on, on Africans. And so I will, I will end now. There's, of course, there's much more we can say about this topic, um, but I think it is very clear that under the national um, legal regimes of Europe, um, slavery and slave trade were crimes. Also, under the international law that was in place in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, slavery and slave trade were also crimes. And so there is um, there's no defense. There's no defense to say we don't owe reparations because slavery and slave trade were legal at the time when they were practiced. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And then apologies for having to, to cut you off. But um, what, what the all party parliamentary group will do is at your request, we will we will write to, to the government supporting um, CARICOM's call for a meeting. Uh, to discuss this. It seems that they, well, we know that they haven't taken this seriously enough and we think it's wrong and um, that they continue to refuse to meet with you um, on, 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 on this matter, even just to begin a discussion um, about it. So we'll make sure that a letter goes from, from members of parliament that, re that represent the all-party parliamentary group on reparations uh, to, that, to that effect. And, and with that, we're going to go to our, our next speaker, um, who is is I'm trying to remember what country um, she's in. She's in Jamaica. She's in Jamaica at the moment. And Professor Vivian Shepherd, who is a world-renowned historian and one of the Caribbean's uh, preeminent scholars and advocates on, on gender justice, racial equality, uh, and non-discrimination and, and reparation for the impact of European colonialism on Indigenous peoples, Africans, and people of African and Asian descent and the continuing harm of colonialism on African diaspora communities. Uh, she's currently one of the three vice chairs of the CARICOM 
Reparations uh, Commission. Uh, Professor Shepherd, over to you. Thank you very much. Greetings to everyone. I am really grateful for having been invited by all the planners and ideators and initiators of this conversation. Now, your introduction has made it quite clear um, that I'm not a lawyer and also David has covered and others have covered a lot of the legal issues anyway. So I'm gonna focus on two of the sub, sub themes that um, you articulated when you sent out the information on this event. So I will briefly touch on the moral imperative for reparation that you uh, highlighted and the alternatives to litigation. But let me stress that I have been around lawyers like Anthony Gifford and David Kamishang, um, who I am delighted to see uh, at this event uh, today, to know that the right to reparation is recognized by international law that the transatlantic trafficking in enslaved Africans and the chattelization and dehumanization of Africans were crimes against humanity. There are both legal and moral reasons why reparation is past due. And I will focus on the non-legal, but let me make it clear that they are not mutually exclusive. The legal case, if pursued, will depend on all the other, the other evidence that can be mustered by historians and other experts. So I offer some of the moral arguments that legal scholars will need if litigation eventually is the route taken uh, if other routes break down. And perhaps it's going to be the route because um, David mentioned the letter that was written to the United Kingdom and uh, I saw the response to it, and the response was not hopeful at all. So if the old parliamentary group can help us to broker that meeting that we're calling for, I think that would be wonderful. So in, term of, in terms of the moral imperative, let me say a few things uh, about that. To start off, I use the occasion of Labour Day in Jamaica today to remind the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland that it has a moral obligation alongside all the legal, economic, and other obligations to settle the outstanding debt for what its armed forces in Jamaica did to those who struggled against this indecent chattel enslavement regime in the island in various wars of resistance. And that goes also for other regions where resistance never stopped against this indecent system. That regime kept hundreds of Africans and their descendants working without wages in horrendous conditions in the interest of capitalism. It sanctioned the rape of women and girls without impunity. And perpetrators had the temerity to boast about their dastardly acts in archival documents, perhaps believing that those they denigrated would never ever have the opportunity to read those documents, or maybe they didn't even care. The regime passed laws to render black people chattel and non-humans. And you can see Elsa Gavaya's work on the slave laws for evidence of that. And they created a pigmentocracy that gave superior meaning to whiteness. The regime of slavery denied socioeconomic and political rights to Africans. It used brutal measures to suppress resistance and at emancipation and independence, it walked away without leaving a financial package to aid development while paying enslavers and ensuring the continuation of ideologies that perpetuated anti-Black racism in this country and all over its empire, including by the way, India, not coming out of enslavement necessarily, but out, out of huge atrocities under colo British colonialism. So while I hear the, the call on the present prime minister to do something, and I also hear about his attitude, I think he should think again. The DDPA recognizes the relationship between historic injustices and socioeconomic underdevelopment 
as Sir Arthur Lewis, Eric Williams, and Lucille Mayer and others did all those years ago. The DDPA insists that, and that's the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, insists that historical injustices have undeniably contributed to the poverty, underdevelopment, marginalization, social exclusion, economic disparities, instability, and insecurity that affect many people in different parts of the world, in particular in developing countries, and recognizes the need to develop programs for the social and economic development of these societies and the diaspora within the framework of a new partnership based on the spirit of solidarity and mutual respect. And David talked about our effort to get a meeting and to have a conversation in the spirit of solidarity and mutual respect. But we wait to see. More specifically, because I just returned from laying a floral tribute to Sam Sharp in Jamaica's National Heroes Park, I remind Great Britain and Northern Ireland of its moral obligation to Samuel Sharp, the leader of the greatest revolutionary struggle against British colonialism in Jamaica, as well as those in his army. On this day in 1832, Samuel Sharp was hanged in Jamaica. And because of that, we start Labor Day each year with a floral tribute to him and others, other revolutionaries who were murdered along with him in that 1831-32 Emancipation War. And I want to take time out because sometimes we forget those who brought us to this space and to this place. I want to call some of their names because they were murdered. James Bernard, Charles James, Henry James, Robert Griffith, Richard Gray, James Petersgill, Bob Peterkin, Henry Cowan, James Malcolm, William Miller, Robert Rose, Richard Trail, George Spence, James Davidson, Angus Forbes. And I'm only reading those who were enslaved on livestock farms in Jamaica, not on the sugar plantations where women were also hung. So regardless of Britain's denial and silence and erasure, the evidence of the moral wrong is strong. It can no longer be denied that a defendant or perpetrator exists. There is no denying the fact that plantation slavery provided the scaffold for Britain's industrial advancement. The injustice is well documented. Scholars worldwide have presented evidence of the brutal nature of the Mangamese. And we heard some of that um, from previous speakers. And the, demo dem the demographic disaster that was plantation slavery is also well known. For example, a total of 5.5 million Africans were trafficked to the British colonized Caribbean over two centuries. Yet in 1834, just 800,000 remained. That qualifies as genocide. The victims are also identifiable as a distinct group. We have the indigenous Caribbean people who survived the harsh policies of European countries and the descendants of enslaved Africans constitute identifiable communities. The descendants of victimized groups continue to suffer harm. We can't say it's so long in the past and we must forget about it because the harm the, of the historic wrong continues. This remains true today as the institutionalized racism of the colonial era has had a debilitating impact on Africans and people of African descent. In the spaces where slavery was, was uh, um, entrenched as well as in the diaspora, there's also precedent for the payment of reparation. And we all know the most blatant one, um, which concerns France and Haiti. So these strong justifications should defeat the opposing voices who argue against the moral and legal arguments. They say slavery is too long ago in the past. No, it's not. There are no victims. They are all dead. No, they are not. Descendants cannot claim on behalf of their ancestors. The lawyers tell me that there is nothing in international law to prevent the descendants of the original harm from um, claiming reparation on behalf of their ancestors. And in any case, the descendants continue to suffer from that historic wrong. Then the, the opposing voices say it's too complicated a matter. No, it's not too complicated for us. We can work it out. 
descendants of enslavers cannot be held responsible for the sins of their ancestors? Well, the heirs of enslavers now show that this is a false claim because they are busy trying to make amends, even if we do not all like the strategies that are being used. And then they say governments cannot pay. Well, let us sit on the table and, and do the calculations and see. And then they say it is time to forget the past and move on as friends. As former UK Prime Minister David Cameron insulted us and told us in 2015. Let me now turn quickly to the alternative to litigation. Because even as litigation must not be ruled out, there are other models that are around. And David already mentioned the CARICOM Reparation Commission's 10 point plan. But I will emphasize it again because that is what has been put forward by the governments of the region, the heads of government. And we know it is not a plan that is a one size fits all. We know that other reparation advocates in other places have different quite legitimate plans and strategies. Indeed, it does not have complete buy-in even within the Caribbean, much less elsewhere. And the main criticisms are that it is too state directed, that it does not give more space to those who suffered under the Indian labor migration system or the indentureship system, that it ignores the hard hitting demands of civil society, especially the indigenous peoples and Rastafari, and that the diaspora is not sufficiently represented in its claims. Maybe if those calling for a joined up approach ever achieve this, then there will be a one model approach, but we are not there yet. So we can only speak about what the Caribbean region that has suffered from the ravages of underdevelopment at the hands of colonialists through their governments with some input from civil society have put forward. The approach chosen is to demand a development package to address the current socioeconomic impact that colonialism with its racial capitalistic enterprise has had on the region. And you have heard that letters to request a meeting to discuss this have been sent with little positive response. The plan is being revised as we speak as the CRC seeks to address some of the gaps that well-being critics have leveled at it. But in broad terms, it seeks a dialogue with the former colonizing powers around the following, a full formal apology, repatriation for those who desire it and choose it, an indigenous people's development program, the building of cultural institutions, attention to the public health crisis, attention to education, an African knowledge program, building that out to rekindle broken bridges, psychological rehabilitation, technology transfer, debt cancellation. And Anthony Gifford knows that Jamaica is also drafting a petition to the king. I know there are those who oppose the plan, but until such time, that's what we have in the region. And a new, more realistic quantification of the damage on which the demand must rest is being worked out as we speak and will be unveiled on June 8th. And then we will see how this plan and the CARICOM and other plans can benefit from this new analysis and quantification. But let me say this as I end. While we wait, let us ensure that we find ways to remember those in whose name we are fighting this war against injustice. The story of conquest, usurpation, manipulation, and illegitimate appropriation of Caribbean resources by colonial powers all features of colonialism and colonization is a familiar one. As scholars have shown, colonization entailed the adjustment on ancestral lands of erected structures of domination and control. As an important stage in the global process of westernization, it meant the imposition of racism, the principal assumption of difference, and the elevation to iconic status of discoverers, so-called discoverers, monarchs and military people. Given these features of the colonization project, not surprisingly, since the period of modernity, as several scholars have demonstrated, Caribbean and other colonized people have sought to eradicate and dismantle political structures of imperialism, historical representations of the Caribbean in text and image that mostly reflected European colonial subjectivity 
and authority. We have sought to remove the iconic stamp of the colonizers in the process reclaiming and restructuring the indigenous, African, Creole, and later Asian experience. The erection of monuments of the leaders of the anti-slavery struggle and black liberation movements has been an essential post-colonial activity and is part of that process of what we are calling in our region internal reparation. Indeed, all over the African diaspora, the descendants of Black freedom fighters have devised creative ways of revoicing collectively the Black experience and find appropriate ways to honor the memory of the African freedom fighters. Let us find ways to build sites of memory to them, even if colonizers don't want to participate in that project and are busy re-inscribing on the landscape those we want to take down or that we took down. Let us find ways to teach about these icons, to call their names every chance we get, and to elevate them to the status of national heroes, heroines, and icons every chance we get. Otherwise, there will be, as Toni Morrison said, no place that you or I can go to think about or not to think about, to summon up the presence of or recollect the baseness of what they did to the enslaved, nothing that reminds us of the ones who made the journey and of those who did not make it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shepherd, uh, for, particularly for outlining um, CARICOM's plan. And we're looking forward uh, to hearing the announcement on 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 June eighth, um, and you know just 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 to explain because many people do ask um, why the APPG is called the APPG for African reparations, um, and they say things like, well, what about Caribbean reparations or those for for African Americans? And it's very quite specifically spelled African with a K, which definitely confused um, the parliamentary authorities, um, and it is about. Our, our unities as, as, as peoples of African descent all over the world, wherever uh, we might be in Africa, in the Caribbean, in the US, in the UK, in, in, in the rest of Europe, in the rest of, of the world. And that understanding that whilst we may have um, individu individual activities and campaigns for reparations in our area, that all of them are worthy of discussion and recognizing the fact that wherever we have been, whenever we have not been completely unified in our purpose, it has always been uh, to our complete downfall. So I think that's very, very important um, um, to, to, to think about. I'm very, very pleased to, to uh, welcome our, our, our next speaker, um, who I, I remember as we were setting up the all-party parliamentary group, I was very impressed uh, to see that a member of the House of Lords had spoken quite extensively um, about reparations and had done so um, and worked on it in partnership with the, with the, with the, with the late great Bernie Grant, showing that the work uh, for, for reparations in the, in the UK, um, even speaking about it in Parliament, um, had, had begun a long, long time ago. And we are hoping that um, uh, Lord Gifford will also join the APPG as a member. Uh, we would very much like his, his clout. So, so Anthony Gifford KC um, is a barrister member of Jamaica's National Council on Reparations. Um, he was called to the English Bar in 1962 and later on called to the Jamaican Bar in 1990. And on uh, the 13th of March 1996, he introduced a debate in the House of Lords calling upon Her Majesty's government to make appropriate reparations to Africans and their descendants for the damage caused by the slave trade and the practice of slavery. So the legal argument has already been um, laid out in, in this house. We're going to ask uh, uh, Lord Gifford to, to give it to us again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Madam Chair, colleagues, friends, sisters and brothers, I really am thrilled to come back from living for many years in Jamaica to be part of this meeting and this movement, to see it flourishing once again. Uh, I was introduced to the liberation, to the Reparations movement by a number of elders who are no longer with us. I'd like to pay tribute to them. First, from Britain, Bernie Grant, who you've been mentioning. Bernie was a giant, a true leader. Uh, his first day in the House of Commons, he wore this wonderful African robe. 
symbolizing his unity with the Caribbean and Africa. And he, he died far too soon. He was a great man. And I, I, I see in this gathering, and for you, Madam Chair, I see you taking on that, that battle, picked up the battle and achieved. Uh, so in Jamaica, I want to pay tribute to Dudley Thompson. Dudley Thompson was a Jamaican politician uh, for many years, but I remember him when he was the ambassador from Jamaica to Nigeria. And he was the co-organizer of the Abuja conference. This is the first Pan-African conference on reparations. And he organized it along with another great man, Chief MKO Abiola of Nigeria. He was in April 1993, when the Abuja conference was held, he was running for president of, in the elections which would have come in June. The elections came, he won his presidency, he was stripped of the presidency, he was exiled, he was imprisoned, and he died in prison. Such is, and I have no doubt, I have no doubt that his stand on reparation, the way he and Dudley spanned the world, they joined the Africa, and, and Africa and the Caribbean, uh, and re reaching out as well to African Americans and, and British. Uh, but it is that commitment that caused him to lose, to be, to be stripped of that election. Because when you, I remember in that conference, there were invited guests from the, from the British and other diplomatic corps, and the look on their faces when this bold, strong African leader undertook to take the cause of reparations to the, to the United Nations General Assembly and get it, get it through. That is something which they had to stop. And make no, 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 no doubt, no, no bones about it. It's a topic which, uh, which disconcerts the British powers that be, because it changes the relationship between white and black, between the Britain and the former Persian. It changes the relationship from aid to justice. Instead of <coughs> wanting, giving, a, giving, a, giving aid to Jamaica, the reparations campaign is based on the fundamental concept that justice demands that Damages are paid, but aid damages. Um, in Jamaica, I want to pay a collective tribute. When I say collective, it's, you'll understand why when I say it's a collective tribute to Rastafari. Rastafarians were speaking of. Yes, applause, it's a bit more life in the place. So this, is, this is not an easy place. Um, I remember. Reese Williams was a brother, John Lloyd, and he used to talk about repatriation. And I would reason with him that repatriation is, is not the same as reparation, it is part of reparation. It is, of course, the most important, one of the most important steps for reparation, reparation program to include is that people whose ancestors were transported from here to there get the necessary support to go from there back to here as they wish to. And I said there are a lot of Jamaicans who want to, a lot of Jamaicans who would love to be, to go to Africa. And those Jamaicans who I know who have been to Africa, as I have many times, can speak of the the beauty, the rhythm, the spirit. And those, it would be a very, I, I, I have a, it's a bit of a pet hobby horse, but I wrote an article called Let's Fly to Africa, Kingston to Accra Direct. And I envisaged, and I still envisage, it may be something for the private, private sector organizations to take on, but I envisage, and there's been some work done on it in Panama, I envisage a new Black Star Line, or a Black Star Airline, or both, 
taking, subsidizing or free, or giving free passage for those who want to visit Africa and be, be filled with wonder at the civilizations and the spirits of the place as I have been. Now there's a new generation. And I want to say how much I salute the two colleagues who have just spoken. David and Mr. Young was talking to you about the Durban conflict. Because after Abiola was in prison and Duke Ross was killed, the reparation movement, as it was as intended by the powers that be, started to fall off a little bit. And in Durban, people took a stand. And the man that you heard, David, you were one of the leaders of the Caribbean delegation who took a stand against a, a, a drive from the powers that be, the Western powers that be, to take reparations off the agenda of the Durban Conference on, on Racism. And they failed. And ever since the century turned and that Durban Declaration was passed, you have seen a rise in consciousness, in activity, and in the organization of this, the reparations movement, the reparations campaign. This evening's discussion raises the question, is there a legal basis of the, of the claim for reparations to the transatlantic trade in Africans? You notice I, it's something that my dear mentor and friend, Vereen Shepherd, Professor Shepherd, taught me that she never uses the word slave trade because that, that in a sense categorizes the people in the way that the West, the, the plantation owners and their governments wanted to categorize it. Transatlantic trade in African, African people. And I say yes, for many of the reasons that's already been given. Yes, there is a legal basis. And, and to support my answers, I turn to the paper which I wrote in April 1993 for that very conference. It was like Dudley Thompson who invited me to present a paper. We were, and uh, I, was, I was shocked, I was amazed, I was humbled. What a brief. The legal basis of the claim for reparations. But I'm not an international lawyer, but I read some of the basic works and I Although I'm not an international lawyer, what I am is a fighter for justice. And out of those texts, I fashion the paper which you see. By the way, I can't accept your invitation to join the all party parliamentary group because I'm no longer a member of the House of Lords. The last speech I made was the one that's been referred to, the, the, the demand for reparations. After that, there was a bill passed in 1999, which abolished most of the hereditary um, lords, and I happily went on my way. But the label stuck, especially in Jamaica. So think you're Lord Jiffin, they'll call you Lord Jiffin. And so I decided to use that label as a banner to infiltrate the, the opposition and be part <laughs> of the progressive movement. But, I, but sometimes I don't want to throw it in the bin. It's a, it's a system which should, should be abolished. We need constitutional reform. We need to get rid of the whole House of Lords, whether they have people there on merit, or whether they pay dues to the party, or whether they're hereditary. Anyway, that's, that's, that's another question. <laughs> As someone said, I, I posited seven propositions. First of all, in the question, what is the crime? The mass kidnap and enslavement of Africans, I wrote, was a crime against humanity. The Charter of the Nuremberg War Tribes Tribunal defines crimes against humanity as, quote, murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and inhumane acts committed against any civilized civilian population, whether or not in violation of the domestic law where perpetrated. Note that last sentence, whether or not in violation of the domestic law where perpetrated. So you can't, as David was telling us, you can't just enact, write, put into practice a number of racist, gross, 
slavery laws, and then say you created law. He is right in saying, and he gave many of the reasons, that the courts in England were still declaring the enslavement of people to be odious and illegal. And he has always given us a lot of offices as we work down on that. So the crime, in a way you can call the transatlantic trade and the institution of chattel slavery in the, in the Americas as the ultimate crime against humanity. Because the perpetrators treated the victims as non-humans, beasts of burden, cargo, which could be thrown aboard, if, overboard if need be, as in the case of the Zion. What is the remedy? Well, international law recognizes that those who commit crimes against humanity must make reparation. Reparation was defined as long ago as in 1927, in a case called the Chaucer Factory Case in the, in the Permanent Court of International Justice. Quote, reparation must, as far as possible, wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and re-establish the situation which would in all probability have existed had, it not, had the act not been committed. Well, that's a big mouthful. Re-establish the situation which would in all probability have existed. I like to think that in all probability, if it hadn't been for the crimes of slavery, people would treat each other as equals. <coughs> we talk about damage and injury, and we talk about it most in the context of the Caribbean, where psychological, cultural, other economic, other kinds of damage can be catalogued. It's not just the Caribbean that's sick. Britain is sick with the with the disease of racism. What, 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 what a <coughs> you laugh because it wasn't so serious. You call yourself better than someone because of your colour. It's madness. And I like to think that part of the reparations, the effect of the reparations movement will be. To strike another blow. We are striking blows all the time, but then the racists are trying to get back. And I think Gary Lineker was right. There is a, I, I see coming back to the UK. I see a dangerous uh, incitation of prejudice and the reemergence of the tools and the, the, the methods by which uh, other racist powers have established an illegal system. There are, of course, precedents for rep reparation, reparative justice. Germany paid huge amounts of money as reparations to Israel and to the Jewish people, quite rightly so. And if you want to say, well, that was just the same generation, look at Aotearia. You know where Aotearia is? Anybody? Aotearia. Aotearia is the, is the proper name, the Maori name for New Zealand. And in New Zealand, there was a, a, a settlement called the Waitangi Claim Settlement, whereby the Maori people received back land and money, uh, which had been seized from them in, 18, in the 1870s by the British invaders. So nobody says it's too old, it's too long ago. Look at Aotearia. And you'll find uh, uh, the text of a Reparations Act, which is in fact signed into, 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 into law by the Queen. So, and don't also be daunted by the magnitude of the task. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it takes a long time to get justice. The African National Congress was founded in 1910, took them 84 years that they established a, a one person, one vote democracy in South Africa. Takes time, takes suffering. Is it true? Yeah. I'll, I'll just read the rest of the proposition and try to make way for discussion. Was it too long ago? There is no legal barrier to prevent those who suffer the consequences of crimes against humanity from claiming reparations even though the crimes were committed against their ancestors. And there is a United Nations Convention on the Non-Applicability of Statutory Limitation to War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity.
I say that the claim would be bought on behalf of the living descendants of enslaved Africans, and you've had some reasoning already about that. Interestingly, in the debate in the House of Lords, the Lord who spoke for the government tried to ridicule me by saying, the case for reparation, I remember him saying, the case for reparation, my Lords, depends on showing that African people today are suffering from the effects of slavery. There is no evidence of that. And that statement to me was a challenge to the academics, to the doctors, to the historians, uh, to all who can show. And believe me, living in Jamaica for 20 or 30 years, I have seen how deeply I have seen the suffering in present day living Jamaica as the most people, even, even in our own first shepherd will, will remember, even in our, our own council, sometimes uh, uh, an academic like Professor Hutton will speak, speak and go on for about half an hour talking about just ad living, but showing the effect on the psychology of present day Jamaicans, what happened 20 years ago. The remaining proposition that I'll just read to you. Who are the claimants? The claim will be brought on behalf of all Africans in Africa and Africans in diaspora who suffer the consequences of the crime. We'll have some more talk about that. But it's important to, to trace the present day economic and other suffering with the slavery system. And we say that if, if a country is to make a claim, should be done in the British system by the Attorney General of that country on behalf of the people of Jamaica. And a petition, as you, you, you were told, a petition is in fact being considered by the Jamaican Attorney General and will soon be considered by the Cabinet to go to the Privy Council under Section 4 of the Judicial Committee Act of 1833, which says, quote, it shall be lawful for His Majesty to refer to the said Judicial Committee for hearing or consideration any other such matters, whatever as His Majesty shall think fit. And such committee shall thereupon hear and consider the same and shall advise His Majesty in manner of foresight. This is a separate jurisdiction. It's a very wide jurisdiction. And under the initiative of a number of politicians and lawyers, Mike Henry, Frank Fitch, the petition has been prepared and will soon be, hopefully, if it's approved by cabinet, will be lodged with the Privy Council. The questions I asked, who are the defendants? We'll talk about that. What, what is the damage? We've talked, about, we've talked about that already. Is there a court or tribunal? And I, I said in 1993 that I thought that the national courts are not appropriate, but I hear all kinds of buzzy ideas. And the point is that anything, for instance, if the Privy Council take on this Jamaican case, we want your support. We want you to fill the public gallery with all the respect and passion of this, this situation, this, this cause in general. And we will get justice. This growing movement is saying to the British and other governments, you committed crimes against humanity over a century, involving millions of people, and you have a legal duty to repair the damage. We're not asking for aid, we demand justice, and there is a legal basis for the demand. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much for, giving, for outlining that to us. Um, and, and, and I think it was perfect uh, the way in which you ended. It's not aid, it's, it, it's simply justice, and, 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 and nothing more than is, is, is deserved. Um, we do have a very, very small amount of time. And when I say a small amount of time, I do. You have heard a lot of, of speeches today, people outlining um, the, the, the legal basis of for reparations. I will, I simply cannot accept any speeches uh, from the floor. Um, if you do have something uh, or a question briefly to ask, we'll try and get it answered. Uh, but we have to remember because this is one of the later meetings in the house today, if you don't leave, um, the people that work in the house do not leave, and that's not fair to talk to them. 
and um, because they have been quite gracious in hosting a number of these meetings um, for us over the past past few weeks in in particular, some of you have seen me more than you might have cared to in the past few weeks. Um, uh, we will have further meetings, and um, there will be one before we close uh, political case reparations, um, where you find many MPs speaking about this. So please do. Anyone has something? Um, I, I, would, I need to see your hand now, um, and I need to uh, take, take it in around. Hopefully, we'll have some time for, for our speakers to come back, but it's likely that we might not. Any, any, so everybody that's raised their hand um, is are the only ones at this moment that I see um, that are, are are going to be speaking. I see yourself in 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 the back there, and no, no, yeah, I see, I see yourself, and uh, please do keep it to, to to thirty seconds. I see yourself, I see yourself, but I know I I know about you, and I'm not sure. I'm not. We're going to see how much time we've got. <laughs> Uh, and see yourself, I see yourself, I see yourself. If we can keep it to 30 to 45 seconds, everyone's going to get in now. Oh, and, and please say who you are and what organization you're from. Um, I am with um, BLM Brandon, GSD, and I'm Union. Um, and just to quickly ask, in terms of the legal um, terminology, for trans Atlantic state trade, that doesn't be put in writing in the paperwork that goes through, or if you don't have the correct terminology, please then. I'm being important, I just wanted to find out, you know, what, you know, in that particular instance, what are you going to put forward for the, for the legal case? Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Oh, I thought I recognized you. Okay. Yes. So the question is uh, building a legal case. Um, have you had contact with uh, uh, representatives of countries uh, that were really that really suffered from uh, from slavery? That was a simple question. Thank you very much. And um, outstanding. Judy Richards, Global African Congress UK. I wondered whether there was any um, work being done looking at the UN processes, such as the uh, Committee on the Nations of Discrimination. We've got the UN Forum for People of African Descent and various other bodies that some of us are working with already, but clearly are interested in. Would make it easy to do international service. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, my name is Jeff Clear. I'm a, um, a PERT. Yeah, I'm a director of a, a Rastafarian Reparation and Repatriation Committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we represent the largest Rastafarian group right across the world, definitely in Europe. Right, and um, we have um, our headquarters is in Streatham. Okay. okay, right now, um, one of the issues we have, right, is the is in terms of repatriation, right? Because we want to repatriate, we want to repair the damage. One of the issues that we have, yeah, is the right to return, yeah, um, for forty. 50 years, we've had to go on visa, um, holiday visa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a problem. We need CARICOM and the African Union, right? And to, to represent, right? Um, to represent us, right? And to make sure that we, the African slave diaspora, because we are different. Yeah, there's a slave diaspora. Yeah, every country has diaspora stuff going on, but they don't mention the slave diaspora. So the slave diaspora, we need unfettered access okay. yeah, to much. Africa, right? And um, also, just one other thing: UK, British, Caribbean children, mm -hmm. right? Nobody talk about them. Yeah, but they are. Under a lot, a lot of pressure for the past since we came here. Mm -hmm. I'm a born and bred Yorkshire man, right? But since we came here, all 
the statistics, all the indicators suggest yeah, that institutional racism right, plays a, a major part in criminal justice, education, stop and search, the whole lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ryan Clements. I'm a barrister in the law. My two questions are that need to be answered uh, tonight. Um, I've heard there's been a lot of breach of international law with, uh, with regards to the transatlantic slave trade. My, my understanding, I have very little or nothing about um, international law, is that a lot of the international law came after. The, the start of the um, transatlantic um, slave trade. So I wonder how that could be a breach of some important existing for the crime. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the second point is that the, I've heard um, a point you made that the, it is illegal or legal the, um, the uh, slave trade. I have a friend who a case for it. I have a lawyer. Um, when the, when the um, slavery was abolished, that gave the impression to me. That it must have been legal to then be abolished, otherwise it would be illegal. It would be abolishing from the police. So what? Mm -hmm. um, what? Yeah, oh, thank you. My name is Dana Asante, uh, Secretary of the Fat Coalition UK and Global African Congress Co-Chairperson of the International Body and Secretary of the UK Chapter. Uh, one of the things we've done is look at language and to us language matters. Mm -hmm. We know people are using enslavement, but in terms of uh, trade, we would rather it was called the trafficking of Africans sure. rather sure. than a trade, okay. because a trade implies legality. And since we know it was illegal, let's call it trafficking. And the second thing is racism against people of African heritage should be referred to as Africophobia, because it actually um, links it to Africa and all people of African heritage suffer from that. Anti black racism refers to all people who are non white. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very much. Uh, thanks, Lemuro Watson. I hope that as soon as possible they don't stop calling our ancestors slave. I share you that term. Uh, it's insulting, and I, I don't see why any African would say that. But uh, my question really is that uh, one of your bullet point is, is what, if the, what are the consequences of a failed legal action? Now, we've heard it from a number of people, including David and, and Tony, that at the UN, where I attended, we achieved the agreement that this was a crime against humanity. So can we understand that all the other avenues are very much able to try everything, including, you know, maybe going down the parliament to pick a few people, we actually have a legal statute on the issue of human rights. This is a crime against humanity, and that cannot be resolved until the victims are satisfied. So that's a fall away uh, position, I hope, the fallback position. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, somebody called Wayne that I couldn't see because no, don't no, don't eat no, 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 it. But that, don't don't ignore me now. Go over the 30 seconds to have a problem. I've allowed you to make speeches in the past. Wayne, Wayne. Yeah, um, I'm Wayne Jones. I'm from Nigeria. Um, I was going to ask you a question. We have volumes that have been written on the slave trade that has been from the plenty of legal rules. Decades of study by it. You know about the morality, about the legality of them. And several speakers speak about the surplus that was used to create the development of part of capitalism. So, yeah, has Caricom, any of the Caricom countries in all of the discussions, right, spoke about how the only way I can see them getting any of this surplus and, 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 and reparation and substantial one is by dismantling capitalism. So, how, how what is, has that ever been discussed? I mean, there's, there's no point. I, I don't know any capitalists who willingly just give up money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you very much. I'm begging you. Don't beg the chaotic 30 second. Prospect Quaker Galaxy Affiliate.net presenter and part of the management of Galaxy Radio. Um, Mr. Gifford, yes. you spoke about um, it was international law around about the 15th century. Whose who, who international law was that? Was African governments and African kingdoms involved in this international law? Because oftentimes the way international law is it, about white people. You understand? African governments are the, the, the Caribbean people them at the time who was invaded. They're not a part of this international law. So I think we need to address this whole thing about international law because the laws is being done by the people them who have power. And this whole thing is about power. He that wields the power, wields the, power, wields wields the determination. You understand know I me? Mean? So we have to get the power. So that may I say right now. We give 36 seconds yeah, December. Next time you play it up like that. Like, like, like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, are, are there any um, that, that you'd like to come back on with very, very quickly? Yes, um, just two. The, the partners and the relationship I think from Google, which is um, the uh, reference to the UN and the Committee on uh, Racial Equality. Or sort of reference to them. That is something that we are considering and have sought advice on the Google Council's advice on that particular issue. So, yes, it's certainly uh, 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 an avenue that we should be taking two steps or that interface uh, dispute resolution mechanism under the auspices of the Committee on National Equality for Nations. So, the answer is yes, uh, related to the UN. And then, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Yes. Ryan Stanley. Ryan Stanley, yeah. yes. So the, the second point was about the, this idea that um, at, at the time it was legal uh, to uh, enslave Africans. So what would be the basis? What I think this is one of the things that draws us to the claim of unjust enrichment. You don't have to, to prove that the act um, in, in respect of which you're claiming was illegal, um, as long as you can show that there's been enrichment uh, on one part uh, at, at some of its ends. Then you can do that. We I believe they are bringing claims in relation to to uh, Malawi farmers um, against VAT or in relation to the tobacco farm control. That is a legal practice, the way it's of tobacco is purchased or so not. But we are still bringing a claim to that region because it doesn't have to be legal. Uh, all you have to do is to show unjust practices and, and regions. Thank you. Uh, Mel? Absolutely correct. Um, that I take full responsibility because all the terminology is mine. And we have been grappling with it. It links to uh, Glenwood's point about use of slave. I think we finally, finally moved away from that. Um, we tried very hard. It is very difficult. Um, if you talk about the transatlantic trade, you could be talking about something else. Um, so I think perhaps what we need is some consensus about the language. And maybe there needs to be a separate meeting on consensus because we are always struggling and revising. Uh, Walker and I just this week, I took a red pen to something he wrote and he was saying, don't use this language, and I still got it wrong on something. We'll so, use the word, the Mahanga means it. Well, I use it. Yeah. That's, that's the word, the African um, word. Yes, yeah, so I think that the, I just want to salute uh, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Anand from Haiti. Thank you so much for coming. We really do get what you feel. Uh, Lord Gifford, I believe you want to come back on the right of return and visa restrictions. Yes, uh, things are happening. First of all, in Abuja, in the conference, if you look at the, Decl the Abuja Declaration in 1993, it was expressly resolved, the conference resolved that African governments should give the right of return unless there was some qualifying factor. And only two years ago, I think, the president of Ghana visited Jamaica and agreed to waive the visa requirement. It's happening. All these things happen slowly. The reparations is about many, many different contributions by many, many different people, not just lawyers, but a whole mass. One of the biggest acts of reparation was done by the people who overtopped the Colston statue and threw it into the Bristol Channel. There are all kinds of ways in which this, this struggle can advance. Stay the course, justice will be done. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And well, thank you very much. And our, our speakers online, uh, Professor Shepherd, uh, David Gleason, are, are, are there any David Gleason, are there any lines, uh, final thoughts that you've got for us? Um, if you're still there. Yes. Uh, David, yes. Good. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um I applaud all those who are seeking for language deconstruction in the interest of our people and our ancestors and ourselves. And I just want to say that we are battling, um, trying to teach um, our people here in the region to, not to use the word slaves, um, to increasingly use Maangamizi. And um, I have shifted myself from trade to trafficking. So. Um, it's a hard fight because history is taught by people who are not of the same mind uh, in the schools. History is not even compulsory in our region. And so it is a battle. But those who are in the forefront of the change, um, we're trying to make a difference. So thanks to those who keep pushing and, and, and asking us to be true um, in terms of how we speak about our history and our ancestors. Thank you, Professor If I may, okay. it, it, would, it would be remiss of me um, to allow this session to end without um, paying honor and respect to Anthony Gifford. Um, um, Tony, just like you, I was introduced to the reparations issue by Bernie Grant. And as part of that introduction, he, he he introduced me to your, your famous um, legal opinion of 1993 at the Abuja conference. So, um, like, you know, I, I tip my hat to you, uh, Anthony Gifford, as um, one of the um, champions and pioneers of, of, this, of this struggle. Um, the good news is that we are on our way. I think, I think we are over the hump. I don't think there's any turning back. I have no doubt that our reparations campaign will be successful. In February of this year, the African Union passed the resolution at their heads of government summit in Addis Ababa, where they have now committed themselves to the reparations campaign and to reaching out and partnering with CARICOM on the, the reparations campaign. And in fact, we expect to uh, a team, a very substantial team from the African Union in the Caribbean um, quite, quite shortly um, to discuss how, how we go forward. Repatriation is a must. Repatriation is central to the reparations campaign. In fact, I think it's either the second or third demand in the CARICOM 10-point plan, and it can be done. We can set up a trust fund. We can set up a, a modality. Um, Caribbean governments, um, African African governments, who we can come together, um, we can work out the modalities. What does it mean um, to repatriate? What does it call for? What kind of resources, financial resources? What kind of support at the at the at the governmental level? And we can have a trust fund and a program. We can't do it all at once. We can't repatriate everyone who wants to go at once. But we can have a program where we have annual targets and a trust fund finance that program. So, but we are on our way with all of these things. As Vereen knows, um, CARICOM is now doing a deeper dive into the 10-point plan, looking uh, more specifically at um, how concretely, what, what would it call for to in, implement these, these demands. So brothers and sisters, um, we have a just cause. We have, we, we have a cause that is well-founded in law, it is well founded in morality and ethics, and all we have to do is pursue it with conviction and passion and determination, and we will prevail. Victory will be ours. Thank you very much. And let me just show in that. Let's remember Barbara Blake Hannah and Dudley Thompson. These two brought me into the movement, and I really applaud them today. Oh yes, well we can't forget Dudley. Uh, Dudley, Dudley, and I worked together at the World Conference Against um, Racism. So yes, I mean, so many, so many champions, yes. so many stalwarts. Yes. And uh, yes, we, we, we honor them all. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I was going to say some very great final words. Thank you very much um, to you all, to all of our panellists, um, and to Lee Day, and, and to all of you for, for your continued commitment to, to learning and, and, and coming to these reparations um, meetings. Please do get home safely um, as you exit the room quickly. Um, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you from us as well. Bye-bye.